How are we doing, Craig? <laughs> we are almost there. Almost there. I think we're one away. Let's see, I'm missing anybody. Actually. We're fine. We're good. Okay. So we're good to go. Good evening, everyone. This is the full board meeting of Community Board 5. I'm Vicki Barbero, Barbero, the chair. And um, I'll just go over quickly the two sessions of CB5's uh, full board meeting. We have a public session, which is an opportunity for anyone from the public to bring information to the board. Anyone wishing to speak, please sign up by 6.30. Be sure to include the subject you'll be addressing as well as contact information in case we need to contact you. And remember, there's a time limit of two minutes. The business session of the board is when the board enters into a session which consists of the adoption of the minutes, the chair's report, the committee reports, resolution, a question and comment period, and voting. The comments or questions from either applicants or the public or if additional information is needed or are only allowed with the chair's approval. So with that, um, we will hear from either our electeds or their representatives. Let me take a look at who's here tonight. Use the raised hand feature, please, if you would like to speak. I see Douglas Armour. Oops, that's a panel. Wait, we've got to get into the panelists. Hold on a second. Laurie, you'll be first. All right, thank you. Oh, good evening, everybody. I have three events to share. Um, in response to recent attacks in our community, um, our office is hosting a bystander intervention um, training with the New York City Anti-Violence Project. Um, attendees will learn how to assess the situation, de-escalation tactics and intervention techniques. Um, that particular evening filled up so quickly that we are planning another one. And as soon as I have that information, I'll share that with me, Board 5. Um, next up is on June 3rd from 6 to 8, our office is hosting a virtual ranked choice voting training session with the uh, Campaign Finance Board. Starting this year, um, I think everybody probably knows uh, New York City will be using ranked choice voting in primary and special elections for local offices. And after this, I will drop um, the link in the chat to uh, register. And finally, on May 25th, our office will be joining DSNY on an adopt a basket outreach day. Um, we're gonna start on Bleecker Street and walk up 6th Avenue uh, up to 25th Street. We'll be talking to businesses and to building managers and um, dropping off flyers to explain how the program works. And I'll also um, drop that link in the chat to describe, you know, it's a description of how the program actually works. And that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Lori. Sure. Uh, next up, Franklin from Council Member Powers. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Uh, just some quick points on our end. Our, our office, uh, just like Lori's office, will be hosting a ranked choice voting event. Ours will be in um, communication with community boards five, six, and eight. Um, that will be on June 1st at 6 p.m. More events, uh, more details rather, will be provided. Um, secondly, our office is dedicated to the recovery of Midtown area and working with stakeholders and residents to make sure this happens. The city cleanup core was created to not just beautify, but bring back thousands of jobs for those who are doing so. The program is funded by the federal stimulus and will begin um, this past April and will start to recover in the Midtown area. The, the task force will focus on south of 59th <clears throat> Street, but will have a positive impact throughout the entire district. The cleanup core will be responsible for removing graffiti in Midtown. In addition, our office has uh, funded a vehicle to complete those removals um, throughout the summer and into the fall. Finally, um, as every council member is aware and uh, the city is going through the current budget negotiation with the mayor and that is expected to be agreed upon by July 1st, 
Um, we are happy to talk and meet with anyone in in reference to the budget negotiations. That's it for me today. My time is up and I thank you for yours. Thank you, Franklin. My goodness, I don't see another hand. Am I correct? You are correct, Vicki. Holy Wait. cow. <laughs> okay. Well, then we go right to the public. Hi. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, sorry, Vicki. We just got some hand raised. Okay, good. All right. I see Madeline. Hi, Community Board of Five. I'm Madeline from Senator Liz Kruger's office. I'm stepping in for Justin this evening because we're hosting an event. Um, just want to give you all a couple of legislative updates. Senator Kruger was involved in um, many things up in Albany, but the Senate advanced legislation to extend the state's eviction and foreclosure <clears throat> moratorium, as well as the Protect Our Small Business Act until August 31st to ensure that New Yorkers um, can stay in their homes if they're facing hardships due to the pandemic. This legislation also provides support for struggling small businesses facing eviction and foreclosure threats. Um, the Senate also passed legislation earlier this month in honor of Earth Day and Water Week to continue protecting the state's environment. Senator Kruger um, helped advance a, a package of bills to support survivors of domestic violence and combat human trafficking. Um, we're working, or as I mentioned, we're hosting an event this evening the event, because many of you are occupied this evening, will be recorded and posted to our YouTube if you're interested. It's, we're, we're collaborating with the Manhattan Chamber of Commerce um, on a virtual town hall for small business recovery resources. So that's from 7 to 8.30 this evening. And like I said, it'll be recorded and posted. Um, our next event is next week on Thursday morning. It's the final part of our senior round table series um, and it's, it's um, centered on thinking about end of life decision making. So it's from 11, 10, excuse me, 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. next Thursday morning. That's all I have. I'm open to questions if anyone has any. Okay, thank you, Madeline. Thank you. Next we have Betsy from Congresswoman Maloney's office. Yes. Thank you all so very much. Sorry. I jumped on late, so I was glad I got to Rep Maloney was one of the few guests invited to attend President Biden's joint address to Congress. Um, the president uh, reminded Americans of the challenges we've endured over the past year and how we've united since January 20th to face them head on. And the president emphasized that we need to seize the opportunity to build on the progress of the first 100 days and make a once in a generation investment to create jobs. So Congresswoman Maloney is very excited about the American Families Plan, um, which invests in our kids, our families and our economic future, as well as the American Jobs Plan. Uh, both of these are really exciting for her because these are two things she has spent her career fighting for, uh, families and critical infrastructure investment for our city. So the American Families Plan uh, is a once in a generation investment in the foundations of middle class prosperity, education, healthcare, and childcare. And beyond helping families meet the needs of today, the plan powers the innovation and growth for tomorrow through a historic expansion and access to quality educational childcare. Um, the American Families Plan will uh, make education more affordable and expand opportunity through transformational investments. It'll provide universal access to high quality free uh, pre-K uh, for three and four-year-olds and make a two years of community college free for all Americans. Um, she's really proud to have already started the efforts to expand 3K across our city um, with the money that was secured in the American Rescue Plan. Um, 3K will now be available in every school district across our city. Um, in the American Jobs Plan, Rep Maloney is calling on an extension of the 2nd Avenue subway to go up to 125th Street, funding allocation for east side access, bringing LIRR service to the east side um, and implementing high-speed rail between New York and Boston. Um, so I will leave it there since I am out of time. Okay, thank you, Betsy. Um, Lin Jun, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, Chen. Yeah, thank you. My name is Lin Jun Chen. I'm from Manhattan District Attorney's Office. I'm the community 
coordinator. Um, today I have two updates. The first, our office has created a new presentation focusing on API hate crime. And we have already conducted this presentation several times in Chinatown. And we want to conduct this presentation throughout Manhattan schools. Uh, if anyone is interested in such presentation, feel free to contact with me. I will share my contact information in the chat. And the second is our office has launched our 2021 Youth Against Hate poster contest. It is open to all Manhattan public school students grades six to eight. And the winner school will receive $1,000 to create an anti-hate initiative. Uh, I will share the flyer in the chat too. Thank you, that's all for me today. Okay. Next we have, who did you say, Luke? Harvey Epstein. Harvey Epstein, okay. I don't see him on the, uh, you know, in the list, but he's here, right? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, my name is hi, I'm Harvey Epstein. I'm the assembly member in the 74th district. And I was here just to give a, a budget update on the state budget and to talk about an upcoming event that we're having. Uh, so I represent the east side of Manhattan from the Williamsburg Bridge up to the United Nations. I have a little bit of CB5 in my district. And as people know that we uh, last month we passed a state budget, which provided uh, additional $1.4 billion in education funds to the city uh, and state and really made our commitment to fully funding foundation aid uh, a reality. We are, we've also passed up Mother Nature's uh, Bond Act that we're, that'll be on the ballot for voters for next November. This November on the ballot is gonna be an issue about absentee ballots. Right now the state constitution requires an excuse for absentee. We're trying to move forward that Anyone can vote by absentee without any reason at all. We passed that legislation this past week. It's really critical that we move forward and allow as many people to vote as possible. You know, upcoming uh, primaries in June, and we're having a ranked choice event on June 10th. Uh, people want to learn about ranked choice voting. I know it's a complicated thing for some folks, especially in Manhattan, where some of our races are ranked choice and some are not. So we want to just educate people so that they know what's happening so they can be involved and understand what they're in for before we get to five weeks from now. If people have questions, we can put it in the chat, our, our my email, as well as our office number. If people have questions or concerns about things that are going on in the 74th district, as well as other places across Manhattan, I'm happy to talk to you about it. I just wanna thank you for your time and I don't wanna take up too much of your meeting. And thank you for including me. And if there's a question, I'm happy to take it, but if not, I'm happy to move on. Okay, thank you very much. It's nice to see you. You too. Okay, let's see. Um, do we have anyone else before we go to the public? Luke? Kevin uh, from uh, Brad Hoylman's office. Ah, okay. Hi, uh, just wanted to introduce myself really quick, Vicki. Uh, my name is Tevin Williams. Um, I'm your new liaison from Senator Hoylman's office. He's actually trying to jump on right now. Um, if you could just give him just about another minute. Um, okay. he, I just want to say Are you that. the new Annabelle? I am. I'm the new Annabelle. It's okay. nice to meet all of you, and I'm thankful to be working with you. If you just give him just one minute. He's I'm on. There he is. Hi, hey. Brad. Hey, Tevin. Tevin is the best. He's an author. He's uh, a relatively recent transplant, but he knows New York already probably better than most of our fellow New Yorkers. So he's really taken on a, a leadership role. So I want to thank him for that and welcome to him. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll be very brief, Vicki, uh, just to say that um, uh, I wanted you to know about a few bills that were moving in, um, the, uh, in, the, in the Senate, um, including uh, legislation that uh, would, um, would require the... Um, New York City Department of Buildings and Department of uh, and HPD to maintain public databases of open code violations. Uh, that's S72. Uh, S66 of mine, Vicki, would create something that's called the Adult Survivors Act that passed the Senate Judiciary Committee. That would allow a one-year window for the revival of time-barred civil lawsuits based on 
sex crimes committed against individuals who are 18 years or older. If you remember, we passed the Child Victims Act. This is a companion piece to the Child Victims Act, it, which applies to adults because the statute of limitations for adults who were abused, say by their uh, obstetrician or, or, or their, um, you know, uh, the OBGYN rather, um, or by a movie producer like uh, Harvey Weinstein, they only had three years to file claims against those individuals. So we've extended that time period prospectively to 20 years. And we think we should give all of those people who have suffered these injuries time mm -hmm. to file civil lawsuits retro uh, uh, actively. So that, that's what we're gonna do with that. Um, and um, I have legislation that's cracking down on illegal tampering uh, or disabling of diesel emission controls in vehicles, uh, which hopefully will pass the full Senate. And then I have a bill on immunizations, which is gonna require adult immunization reporting by healthcare professionals. New York is one of only eight states that don't provide that. It is provided temporarily now through executive order. That's how you see all these maps that show whether vaccines are being, uh, are the level of uptake in certain neighborhoods in New York City. Unless we make this a law, we're not gonna have that information, which is so important, obviously, uh, during COVID. A word, uh, I'll close with this, a word on um, the Times Square shooting, uh, which is obviously incredibly distressing when a four-year-old is injured in a random shooting such as that. Um, we've got our work cut out for us on that front. Uh, I've always been an advocate of stronger relations with local law enforcement. And I just wanna thank everyone because Community Board 5 mm -hmm. has always had that mindset too. Uh, to work with the police to make our neighborhoods safer. Um, of course, we need accountability for the police and that's something I've worked on with my colleagues in Albany, but we all have to row together to combat this proliferation of illegal guns. And I've been working on that in particular on what are called ghost guns. And I've mentioned it here before. They're guns that are assembled in parts. You can order them off of the internet you can download them from the internet and print them on a 3D printer. They basically don't have serial numbers, so they're not traceable. And we can't even rely on the police, uh, you know, to, to track those down because there aren't serial numbers. I also am advancing legislation that would require micro stamping. And micro stamping is when a, um, a, a pistol, for example, uh, when a bullet is fired from it automatically uh, a serial number is printed on the casing of the bullet. So that allows law enforcement to, when they retrieve a casing on the, uh, at the site of, a, of, a, of gun violence, to trace that to the, to the gun. Um, so that's uh, new technology, but it is, um, it is becoming more a reality and New York should require it. And then finally on COVID-19 vaccines, uh, you know, we've seen some encouraging news around um, around the availability of vaccines. Please call my office if you're having trouble. Although it seems like you can, you know, stumble outside of your apartment and get vaccinated and you might get, you know, some French fries or a Metro card as a result. <laughs> um, that said, if you're still having trouble or if you know anyone in particular that's homebound on a more serious note, let our office know. Tevin and the team have uh, already arranged over 2,500 uh, vaccination appointments and. Um, and that goes the same for unemployment insurance. We continue to work on that. There's been another log jam, uh, but we will um, try to clear it once again. So thank you so much. Good to see everyone. Thank you, Brad. All good things as usual. Thanks thank again. You. Okay, I think now we go to public unless Luke, there's someone else that um, I'm missing. You're good to go. Okay, so let's go to the public. Two minutes each, starting with Serge Harnett. Serge, you can unmute whenever you're ready. Got it. Hi, everybody. My name is Serge Harnett. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, great. Thanks. I'm here to speak on behalf of Midtown South's Precincts Community Council. NYPD's Chief of Community Affairs tasked 
Midtown South with forming a new precinct community council. Brian Weber and myself will be serving as, as interim co-presidents. The first meeting was held on April 27th and the next meeting of the newly constituted council will be held on May 25th at 6.30 p.m. Going forward, meetings will be held the fourth Tuesday of every month. I will share that link in advance with the board. The Midtown South Precinct Service Area covers 29th to 45th Street, 9th Avenue, Lexington Avenue. Community councils are part of our city's charter and serve as a public forum for the community to ask police questions and address ongoing concerns regarding public safety and quality of life issues within precinct service areas. Meetings will be routinely attended by the precinct commanding officer as well as their community affairs officers. In our case, commanding officer, Deputy Inspector O'Hare and community affairs officers, Burns and Kelly. Meetings are public, open to all. We hope to see you there. Please feel free to reach out to me with any questions. We will share our contact information with the board and thank you very much for your time. Thank you, you're muted. Thank you so much. And next up will be Douglas Armour. <clears throat> Hi, Douglas, you can unmute. Hi, thanks, Luke. Uh, so I'm Douglas Armour. I'm a, a resident and a homeowner on East 20th Street. And I wanted to speak up about the open restaurants program um, in New York. Um, first, I wanted to say I'm a, a, a supporter, very much support the open streets program, which I understand is distinct from open restaurants. Um, I'm old enough to remember block parties. Um, I really value the community spirit that open streets um, is meant to foster um, in the city. I'm also a, a supporter of the hospitality industry and local restaurants in our neighborhood. Um, I thought the open restaurants program, you know, particularly last summer and in the pre-vaccine context um, was a really um, creative and, and necessary, you know, provisional um, measure or experiment for the city um, uh, to take. And, and, and I enjoyed it as much as the next person. Um, but thinking about it in a post-vaccine context, um, you know, in the post-vaccine world, um, after the end of this summer, uh, you know, I've got some, some reservations that I just wanted to express to the community board. Um, and, and I know a lot of the other residents um, on, on East 20th Street do as well. You know, on, on our block, some of the restaurants are abusing the program. There's one restaurant that's storing tables and chairs in the street, not serving food, but storing tables and chairs. There's another restaurant that built a 50 foot long structure four months ago, padlocked it, closed, and hasn't um, used it since. They haven't opened the restaurant either. Um, you know, the about 40% of the block is, is um, you know, covered with uh, out, outdoor dining structures. There's electric wiring crisscrossing the sidewalk. Um, coming home, there's, you, you run a gauntlet of servers carrying the food back and forth, propane heaters, open flames, um, electrical wiring, customers back and forth, tables and chairs. Um, so pushing a stroller down the block, taking the dog for a walk, carrying groceries home um, are, are all you know, very problematic. I realize my time is up. Um, so um, my, my point is being cognizant of ESG and quality of life in the city permanent open restaurants, I think is a very problematic um, solution to the hospitality challenges in New York City on a, on a permanent basis. Thank you, Douglas. Okay, next up will be Vincent Petraro. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes. Great, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Vincent Petraro and I'm here representing the Metropolitan Parking Association. I wanted to speak about the DOT proposal regarding Broadway, most specifically Broadway between 39th and 40th streets. Um, the DOT proposal provides that every other block of Broadway retains at least one lane of traffic, except this one block, Broadway between 39th and 40th streets. There are presently two parking garages on 40th street west of Broadway, whose customers will be adversely affected by this complete closure of Broadway between 39th and 40th. Together, these two garages process 1,900 cars on an average weekday 
and 1,700 on weekends. Of these, presently 80% or 1,520 on weekdays and 1,360 on weekends turn right and proceed south on Broadway. Most then turn right again to travel west on 39th Street. During the peak hour of 5 to 6 p.m., 240 cars exit these garages. By preventing any cars from turning onto Broadway, every car exiting the garages would have to cross Broadway, proceed to 6th Avenue, uh, and then make a left on 6th, a left on 42nd, a left on 7th to continue their trip <laughs> south or west. Uh, this not only adds 50% extra time travel from 12 to 18 minutes, but it wastes 4,000 additional gallons of gasoline, resulting in 80 metric tons of additional gas emitted into the atmosphere. We ask that the community board request that one lane for vehicular traffic remain on the block between on this block of Broadway, or at a minimum, DOT convert 40th Street between Broadway and 7th Avenue into a two-way street so that cars from the garages can proceed west and turn down 7th Avenue. This would save vehicle miles traveled, time, and limit air pollution. This would also prevent additional turning issues at the three intersections. The transportation assessment explaining this in more detail, and I thank you for your time and consideration. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next person would be Catherine Nessel. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Uh, I'm Catherine Nessel. Uh, I'm a volunteer of Transportation Alternatives working on the Open Broadway, Car Free Broadway campaign. Uh, and I just wanted to speak in favor of the DOT proposal that was heard at the Transportation Committee. Um, I was there, it sounded really amazing. You know, more can be done to do that treatment throughout Broadway, but it's an amazing start. And I just really encourage the board to um, go big or go home. And, you know, this is a great crossroads in New York City. You know, we are, more and more people are coming out, um, but we don't have all the um, congestion that we had pre-pandemic in Midtown, uh, you know, with commuters. And it's really good to take this opportunity to redesign the streetscape with minimal impact uh, with construction and, uh, you know, just make Broadway a much more inviting place to stimulate business. I would say that, you know, it's really important I, I think that the block between 39th and 40th is really important to have fully blocked off because even though theoretically, like if you just look, uh, you know, cars may have to do more turns, the idea is that this will convince people to switch from cars to other forms of more sustainable transportation, which in turn, if, you know, if you're decreasing car traffic, that's going to inherently decrease your carbon emissions and improve the air quality in the neighborhood. It also just provides a really important space for uh, you know, people in the neighborhood to enjoy and, you know, it, uh, attract people back uh, to neighborhoods in the garment district uh, or to businesses in the garment district neighborhood, uh, you know, as people are um, considering where to go as they resume their pre-pandemic lives. And I think it's just really important to prioritize, you know, the massive amounts of people who are walking on Broadway compared to the few amount of drivers that it would inconvenience. And, you know, just that those drivers, you know, most of them do not live in the district, do not, you know, may not even work here, maybe, you know, just parking and then going downtown. And it's best to prioritize the district and the needs of uh, pedestrians there. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think that's it. Are you seeing anyone else, Luke? I think that's everybody. Oh, yeah, okay. we have one more Lisa Wager. Okay, Lisa. Hi, sorry about that. I signed in, you know, on the website. I didn't realize I also had to raise my hand. Apologize. So, hi, my name is Lisa Wager. I'm the Director of Government and Community Relations at the Fashion Institute of Technology, the SUNY College on 27th between 7th and 8th. I have just a few fun things that uh, have happened at FNT and are coming up to report on. Um, first off, we won our third consecutive award from the National Endowment for the Arts. That's the NEA. This one's for $25,000 for STEAM education and to support sustainability programming in the college in the year of 2021. Uh, the proposal is called Unconventional Innovation, New Design for a Sustainable Future. And it funds three related programs. First, in partnership with High School for the Fashion Industries, which is in CB4, but adjacent. Um, we're gonna run three workshops for high school students. That's happening in the fall. 
The NEA funds will also support a seminar at the college about the interconnectivity of the global fashion industry in the fall. And the third beneficiary was our 15th annual Sustainable Business and Design Conference. <clears throat> our year end uh, events are just rolling out. The uh, annual School of Art and Design graduating student exhibition went online Monday. It presents the juried award-winning and thesis project work of more than 500 student graduates in 16 areas of study. You can dip in and out of the ones that interest you, um, including toy design, interior design, footwear and accessories design, packaging design, jewelry design, animation, interactive media and game design, of course, fashion design. Um, and finally, there's the always hotly anticipated FIT bachelor degree fashion design runway show. This this year again will be up virtually. That's going up on Wednesday of next week. This gets international media coverage, but this year, and it's a very hard ticket, you can have a front row seat from your own couch. And you'll find both of these on the FIT website, which is fitnyc.edu. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I think that does conclude the public session. Okay, good. That means we enter into the business session, which I mentioned um, earlier, is um, where the board conducts business, which consists of the adoption of our minutes, my chair's report, the committee reports, resolutions, questions and comments, and then of course we vote. So we're now entering into the business session. And the first thing we will do is get a report from the nominating committee the chair being Renee Kinsella. Thank you, Vicki. Um, hi, board. You'll recall at the Fort Bullard meeting on April 8th, um, the members of the nominating committee, which was myself, Rachel Weintraub, Evan Meyerson, Tristan Haas, and Joseph Frewer were announced. And at that time, it was also announced that anyone who was interested in running for a position or nominating somebody else for a position needed to provide their nomination to us, to the nominating committee by the Tuesday prior to the next full board meeting. That was an incorrect date. So after that date, that date was amended by an email which you all received. And that email stated that anyone who would like to be considered for the slate of officer recommendations or to make a recommendation had to provide their submission to the nominating committee by Thursday, April 22nd. Um, for the newer members, and as a reminder to the more experienced ones, the responsibilities of the respected officers' positions as outlined in the bylaws were also provided to all of you in that email. So um, during the process, the nominating committee understands that two members of the board spoke to current executive committee members about the responsibilities and commitment needed for these roles, and they ultimately decided not to put their names forward. Um, additionally, we had one board member who put forward their name and then retracted their nomination once that email was received outlining the responsibilities and the respective positions. We also received six nominations from the current executive committee. All of those who currently occupy and the exec any officer positions have sought their reelection to that same position. The nominating committee met last week and proposes the following slate. Vicki Barbero for chair, Nick Athenell for first vice chair, Clayton Smith for second vice chair, Craig Slutskin for secretary, Julie Chu for assistant secretary, and Aaron Ford for treasurers. Um, at this point, I'll ask if there are any members of the board who wish to nominate any other member of the board or themselves for an officer position. You can use the raise hand. Um, I don't see any, but I'll just check with Luke. I do not see any raised hands. Okay, seeing none, um, we have a slate then to vote upon in June and that concludes the role of the nominating committee. There will be no nominations from the floor in June. Nominations are now closed. They will not be taken from the floor in June and we will vote on the slate at that time. Okay, thank you very much, Renee. And thank you to the nominating committee. Uh, next, I would like to have a motion to adopt the minutes of April. Motion to adopt. And a second. 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 Okay, and a roll call vote. Thank you, Vicki. Uh, Kalis. Yes. Athenale. Yes. Behar. Yes. Uh, Beichman. Yes. Rosnahan. 
Yes. Caparo. Yes. Clark. Yes. Dale. Yes. Dosen. Yes. Ford. Yes. Frewer. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Goldman. Yes. Goshow. Yes. Harris. Yes. Hartman. Yes. Hire. Yes. Isaac. Yes. Kalafarski. Yes. yes. Kinsella. Yes. Logosico. Yes. Levy. Yes. Mafia. Yes. McCall. Yes. Meyerson. Yes. Miller. Yes. Hawson. Yes. Raybar. Yes. Uh, Shapiro. Yes. Slutskin, yes. Smith. Yes. Spandor. Yes. Stern. Yes. Song. Yes. Webb. Yes. Whalen. Yes. Yang. Yes. Uh, motion passes. And just a reminder to put your, so I can see you uh, in accordance with the open meetings law that you can put your video screens on. I know some of you have it off. Some of the board members have them off. Uh, motion passes, thank you. Okay, thank you. We have an adoption of the minutes and we're on to the chair's report. I do have an announcement this evening. Um, it's a, a very nice announcement. Our board member, Matt Hartman, has agreed to take on the task of serving as vice president of our land use, housing and zoning committee. So um, I thought it might be interesting if I gave you just a little bit of history regarding land use and the initial role of the community board. So very quickly, just to let you know that uh, in 1951, the then Manhattan Borough President Robert F. Wagner established 12 community planning councils to advise the borough president on planning and budgetary matters. So there were two, two things at that time. And it wasn't until 1975 uh, and inspired by the Charter Revision Commission recommendations of that year that city residents voted to strengthen the boards as they had come to be known and uh, give them advisory powers that the Charter Revision Commission gave community boards a formal role in three specific areas, budget, service, delivery, and land use. The biggest change as a result of the 1975 Charter Revisions was the Uniform Land Use Review Procedure, which we've all had a bit of along the way, called ULERP, which mandated a community board review and vote on all land use applications, including zoning actions, special permits, acquisition and disposition of city property, and urban renewal plans. As we all know, community boards became the official municipal body whose primary mission is to advise elected officials and government agencies on matters that relate to the welfare of the district and its residents, with land use being one of the first of those responsibilities. It's super involved, it's extremely complicated and technical, and it's very time consuming. So I thank you, Matt, for taking on this responsibility of Vice Chair of our Land Use, Housing and Zoning Committee. Um, maybe you wanna say a few words? Thank you. Thank you very much, Vicki mm. and, and Layla. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited. I've enjoyed working with Layla as a member of the committee and I appreciate the opportunity to serve the, the board uh, and the committee as the Vice Chair. Okay, thank you. and. <laughs> we appreciate it, really. Thank you. Okay, that moves us on to our committee reports, and we will start with Transportation and Environment, EJ. Thanks, Vicki. Uh, t &E had one resolution this month, um, and I'd like to have it deemed read. So deemed. Thank you. Uh, this uh, was a proposal uh, by the City um, Department of Transportation to um, continue a process that has been ongoing for several years at this point to continue to um, uh, uh, reconfigure and pedestrianize um, elements of Broadway across the borough um, using their expanding toolkits of treatments and non-permanent um, street paint 
so, so in a nutshell, this is this is a, a use of various tools, including paint and um, um, collapsible dividers and that kind of thing to reconfigure the street, um, but you know falls short of, for example, starting to bulldoze um, sidewalks or change the levels of the street. Um, DOT has has used this um, this toolkit. Uh, multiple times on different uh, areas of Broadway, and this is a proposal to extend that to three segments of Broadway, um, 21st to 23rd Street, 38th to 40th Street, and 47th to 53rd Street. Uh, the stated goals are to continue to promote um, pedestrian and cyclist safety, as well as to create um, new spaces for public use, uh, particularly, you know, in the, um, the post-COVID era where um, uh, where, where more um, pedestrian and alter, alternative transportation space is needed um, and, and seems to continue this, this trend of, um, uh, you know, thoughtfully and safely pedestrianizing the Broadway corridor while carefully planning so as not to cause any kind of um, uh, traffic or vehicular Armageddon at the same time. <laughs> Um, Broadway, uh, I'm sorry, DOT uh, detailed the public engagement that they've done um, via surveys, community engagement, and in particular, are um, partnering here with, on each of these three segments with um, uh, uh, local um, business improvement districts. Um, from 21 to 23rd, uh, the Flatiron Partnership, from 38th to 40th, the Garment District Alliance, and from 47th to 53rd, the Times Square Alliance. Um, without going into detail about every single block, um, you know, in particular, uh, the, the segment from 21st to 23rd, just south of, um, of 23rd Street in Madison Square Park, um, was based on um, public opinion that they collected. It's intended to improve the, um, uh, to, to increase greater, uh, the use of that st stretch of street by pedestrians. Um, you know, it, both blocks would use um, a chicane style treatment that allows vehicle access, but prioritizes pedestrians and forces cars to, um, to slow down. Uh, the, the segment from 38, 38th to 40th um, uh, similarly um, applies the chicane treatment to, to 38th to 39th, or relocates a city bike dock and um, to, the other, uh, to the other side of the street and uses it to create a, a um, protected bike lane. Uh, they did ask, um, uh, they, they pointed out to the committee that um, they're still assessing whether or not that bike lane should be a one-way bike lane or a two-way bike lane. And the, um, the committee, while generally being approving of the idea of a two-way bike lane, particularly since some bicyclists will use it two-way anyway, it might, it might as well be safely structured for that. Um, we did express some concern uh, uh, about whether or not a two-way bike lane is appropriate when there's no la continuing lane, you know, at the end of the block, moving on to the next block, where would those bikes go and could they safely um, uh, move off the lane? So, um, you know, we, we expressed our concerns and, and DOT may come back to us with more data at some point as they make that determination. Um, the block from 39th to 40th um, would be totally pedestrianized and closed to traffic. It's got there are two entrances to the subway on that block and DOT detailed uh, mitigations that they are putting into place for um, the cars that are forced to turn off Broadway at that point, including um, a, a installing a dedicated um, left turn bay on Broadway uh, uh, at 6th Avenue to um, uh, uh, make sure that, that uh, the cars can wrap around the block um, as a mitigation, you know, as efficiently as possible, there being a new dedicated left turn and dedicated signal timing um, put into place. Finally, the segment between 47th to 53rd Street, um, the goals are to slow down traffic, to increase programming, to um, uh, retain car access and update bike access. That segment um, of six blocks would actually be installed in a phased timeline, um, only the first couple blocks would be would be installed uh, this year, which would be phase one, and it would be extended to that um, sixth block uh, treatment. Over kind of look at the data and adjust the design as appropriate um, after this year. Um, 
our community commentary was was generally supportive of more pedestrianization and the direction that DOT continues to take Broadway um, with a project like this. Mm -hmm. uh, some community members wished it, it went further and banned all cars. Um, some residents um, and community members pointed out uh, that they would like various open streets to continue. And, um, you know, again, this treatment uh, doesn't preclude those those open streets uh, uh, programs from from continuing at all, and they certainly probably would. The city could continue all of those. Um, we heard no objection to, con to con continued pedestrianization, pedestrianization, though um, members of the community pointed out a couple concerns, including access to residential buildings like um, uh, Madison Green between 22nd and 23rd Street, which in our assessment that kind of vehicular access for um, residents would absolutely uh, continue. Um, and then uh, car access to certain parking garages um, near uh, uh, the, 30, the 39th to 40th Street um, pedestrianization, which, you know, again, we heard the mitigation plan for, and in our, estima our estimation, um, the, mit the mitigations were appropriate. And this block has, in fact, been closed to traffic uh, fully closed to traffic for periods of time in the past, um, uh, and the mitigations seem to work well without much um, complaint. Uh, we also heard some resident concern for overnight parking changes um, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, overnight parking may have caused some clubbing problems um, with, with overnight partiers before COVID, but um, given the current state of affairs, the community was generally supportive of that. Um, so again, the, the committee was overall supportive of the plan with, with some stipulations that DOT come back at the end of the summer, let us know how it's going and what data they've collected, that DOT commit to posting signage, um, uh, including um, rules on bike docks that cyclists are required to use the bike lanes appropriately and not to use the pedestrian areas instead, um, which is a problem, that DOT commit to making sure that they're engaging with the visually impaired community and putting audible signal, uh, signals at each crossing, that vehicular access um, to residential buildings like Madison Green be, be maintained, which our assessment you know, confirms it would be, and that the, um, the mitigations to you know, allow car, um, car access to the uh, necessary parking areas um, uh, are, are put into effect. So with those stipulations, um, uh, the committee did support uh, this resolution with a vote of uh, 14 to 1 to 0 to 1. Okay, thank you, EJ. Uh, does anyone have a conflict with this? Mary, you do? And Chris Clark? Yes, I no, I was, I was raising my hand for a question. I'm oh, sorry. okay, okay. Chris, you have a conflict. Correct. Yes. Yes, okay. I do. I'm employed by the Times Square Alliance, which is my okay. great revenue. All righty. Thank you. Um, all right. Questions, Mary. Yeah, I'm just curious why this particular block, 39th to 40th Street, was sort of plucked out to be the chokehold on Broadway for vehicular traffic. I mean, I understand that it has been closed in the past, but the same can be said of all of Park Avenue if you're talking about the Summer Streets project. I'm just very concerned about this particular block being chosen as, a, as basically a chokehold. And I heard loud and clear what uh, the gentleman from the parking garage alliance said before as the meeting commenced. Yep, I, I, my understanding is that, I mean, it has been closed in the past um, for vehicular traffic uh, travel patterns. Um, they have a mitigation plan that they've used in the past and, and are confident in using again. Um, and also, you know, s simply in the, in the location, you know, where it is, it's a logical extension of the pedestrian, of the fully pedestrianized plazas around um, uh, Times Square. So it's an, you know, it's a logical extension of those pedestrianizations to the south of, of Times Square if you're trying to create a kind of, um, uh, chain of citywide um, pedestrianized blocks. Is, is so, so Broadway is fully pedestrianized all the way down to 40th Street? No, I, I'm, not, I'm, not saying it's, I'm not saying it's fully pedestrianized, but I think proximity to Times Square was one of the elements in selecting the block. 
Okay, Mary. I have to say I'm going to vote against it, but I'd like to hear other people weigh in. Okay. Any other questions? Layla. And then yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, EJ, I have a question regarding uh, Broadway between uh, 21st and 23rd. Um, if I read the resolution correctly, um, it looks like so nighttime parking is going to be permitted. Um, and I just want to, as you mentioned, uh, parking at night in this particular neighborhood has been a, a grave problem uh, because of the uh, number of uh, nightclubs and the, uh, the patronage of this, these nightclubs would cause uh, you know, some, some vehicular uh, traffic and noise that would be a, dis uh, a disturbance to, uh, to residents. Um, the, uh, the proliferation of nightclubs has uh, changed a little bit in you know, the past five years, uh, but there's still nightclubs in the, in the area. And uh, you know, they hopefully uh, you know, in a uh, post-vax world, uh, they will reopen. I just wanted to know if our neighbors and residents opined on this particular uh, issue and uh, if you heard directly from, uh, from the residents. Uh, they did. Um, they spoke specifically of certain situations that had existed in the past. Um, you know, I, I mean, exactly like you mentioned, you know, prior, prior to four or five years ago, there were more nightclubs in the area and you would see a situation of people continuing to party at their car all night. Um, it was it, the, the general consensus of the community was that that hasn't been a problem um, for several years. Several nightclubs have closed even prior to COVID, and there were not several of the trouble. Several of the trouble spots were no longer there even before COVID happened, and you know we heard those concerns, but there was no serious pushback from any you know residents to prevent this um, you know uh, the conversion of these spots to new overnight parking from occurring now. Okay, and just to clarify, the resolution says that um, uh, parking would be permitted uh, between the hours of 1 a.m. and 7 a.m. with three-hour metered parking consistent with other nearby blocks. Typically, nighttime parking is free in, in New York, or at least that's my impression. I, I don't know. I, I'm, and we, we, we can take this question offline. It's, it's more of a sort of, you know, curiosity. Sure, I can. I, I don't know the answer off the top of my head, but I can. I can look that up for you and find out how, what they're planning here compares to the <laughs> compares to the. the okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Uh, next question, Will. Thanks, Vicky. Uh, I just had two quick questions, and they're kind of related around this question of enforcement. Um, one of them is about the costume characters. I know that's uh, historically been an issue in particular with regard to the Times Square area. Um, so I'm curious about discussions around that and what the mechanism is, um, should it be exacerbated in any way? Um, and then the other is around enforcement of the bicycle laws. I know that's something that's come up a lot. Um, I heard the gentleman on the call, I think it was last week, talk about that from the perspective of people who are visually impaired and bicycles sort of being silent killers or these uh, electric bicycles in particular being silent killers because they're so quiet and seem to come out of nowhere uh, against you know, what the traffic pattern would indicate should be happening. Uh, yep, on the, first, on the first question of the costume characters, I, you know, I think the intention is that um, you know, the, the these treatments for the block will allow them to be programmed, um, you know, as as desired in partnership with the the you know local bid such as the Times Square Alliance. Um, I think what you know whether they're programmed for that is is you know going to be within the purview of that of that programming system. And I know that Times Square Alliance is is working on you know new methods of keeping the costume characters under control and in certain areas and not, you know, letting the, the intention is not that, that, that they'll be able to, you know, run across all of the newly possessionized areas um, within the chicanes of the, uh, of those blocks. 
um, on the second on the second front, um, yes, the the rules around um, you know bikes and where they're allowed, uh, particularly as relates to anyone crossing, but particularly the visually impaired, um, was something that we heard, and that's why we you know um, included you know con our support contingent on the stipulation that you know DOT is not responsible for enforcement, but they can be responsible for proper signage on bike docks, particularly the bike docks that are being relocated, you know, as part of this plan. And, you know, we made our support contingent on that uh, uh, those rules and where the bikes are, the bikes are supposed to be using the protected bike lane and not pedestrian areas and respecting, you know, the crossing, the, the laws of the crossings, um, that the po posting those rules very clearly for anyone, you know, renting a bike. Um, uh, uh, that our support be contingent on that. And secondarily, to the point of the visually impaired that you mentioned, um, you know, that DOT not only engage the visually impaired community to just, you know, to, to better understand their needs and allowing them to safely cross, but also specifically, we asked that um, audible signals be, you know, provided at each crossing in this, you know, study area. Um, so that, you know, we know that at least that effective step be taken, but also that they continue to engage the visually impaired community to understand what other steps should be taken as well. Thank you, EJ. Hey, Vicki, uh, is this an appropriate time for a friendly amendment or would that be in the next section? No, you can give it a try. Sure. I'd like to make a friendly amendment then, EJ. I, I think that's all great. I'd like to see a little bit more teeth around the um, enforcement of the bicycle laws. And it would be great if we could include something around empowering the NYPD to ticket uh, violators of that. Uh, sure. I mean, in terms of um, uh, the, you're talking specifically about our resolved, let's see, um, uh, about installing signage and, and audible signals. Would that be kind of what you're referring to? Yeah, I, I think that Sorry, plus um, actually requesting that the DOT work with the NYPD to understand um, the situation and um, encourage ticketing of violators of the law. Yeah, I mean, you know, on the one hand, the applicant who came to us is DOT and, you know, we, we feel it's effective to request things of them like signage and working with the visually impaired community around what they have authority over. Um, the relationship between DOT and NYPD is a particularly thorny bureaucratic thing. And we've, um, you know, we've, we've included in innumerable resolutions in the past, asking NYPD to, to further um, uh, enforce the, you know, the bicycle rules of the road. We kind of have an ongoing project as well to figure out what more effective ways that we can weigh in on getting NYPD, which you know, essentially at this at this point enforces what you know they they the city you know tells them to enforce enforce the mayor's office tells them to enforce. Um, you know, we, we're trying. We continue to try to look for effective ways of engaging the NYPD to make sure that those rules continue to get enforced. Um, I have, I have no problem, uh, you know, adding a resolve to that effect here as well. It's been in countless resolutions that we've added in the past, and certainly it's not in the purview, you know, DOT will tell you that, will tell us that it's not in the purview of DOT themselves. I'm certainly happy to add that to this resolution and um, and address it to NYPD. Sure, that'd be great. I, I think it doesn't hurt to reemphasize, and even if it's just using the same language from a previous one, if everyone is okay with that. I'd consider that a friendly amendment, sure. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, next up will be Barbara Spandor. I just want to add that um, as an avid uh, recreational cyclist, um, I think that um, you know, if you're going to be targeting cyclists in terms of which I'm not in favor of people blowing through lights or doing any of those things, I don't mean to say that at all, but there are also um, a lot of violations 
that occur by pedestrians in, um, in bike lanes and also parked cars. I mean, I'm constantly being pushed out of um, bike lanes because of double parking and those are never enforced. Um, and so, you know, I, I have no objection to uh, what Will is suggesting, but I think it's not, um, you know, there are a lot of factors in terms of some of these things. However, you know, I, I'm also, I would like to see electric bikes eliminated, but that's not a part of this discussion. Okay, thanks, Barbara. David Aquiles. Yes, I support Will's friendly amendment. Well, that was short and sweet, thank you. <laughs> okay, Renee. Kinsella. Right, AJ, they, this may not be, it's not particularly to the resolution, but is there some master plan as Broadway gets closed and we talk about open streets to think about, I'm building on Mary's question about the chokes, choke spots around Manhattan overall? Uh, no, <laughs> DOT has not shown us a master plan for Broadway. Um, they, they come to us, you know, kind of piecemeal with these iterative adjustments. Um, which you know, I think uh, uh, they probably see as as within their jurisdictional purview. But um, no, we have not we have not seen a, a end state for um, Broadway or any kind of uh, comprehensive street use plan, as we talk about very very frequently at um, at T and E meetings. It's uh, it's something that we that we'd like to see happen, and um, it's something that has been in some uh, legislation uh, by by mm -hmm. Speaker Johnson in the past. But um, we have not seen that kind of plan generated by DOT at this point. Okay, Mary. Yeah, uh, needless to say, uh, thank you, Renee. I just think in the absence of a master plan to just dump this random chokehold. 39th to 40th street it just doesn't make any sense to me and i know i've gone on record before about the 14th street busway which started out when we thought that we were going to lose the l train but somehow because it was already in the works it became permanent by executive fiat via bill de blasio so i just think that this is a slippery slope we need to be careful about just letting dot try these things out without some sort of master plan. I think it undercuts the confidence that the public has um, DOT to really get, get us all moving. I mean, I'm a biker too, I'm a pedestrian too. I drive a car in the city. We need a plan so that all three of those folks, all, all three of those sides of me can get along. <laughs> okay, any other questions? All right, does anyone have any comments? All right, seeing none, we will take this resolution to a vote. Excuse me, sorry. Uh, Akalis. Yes. Athenail. Yes. Behar. Zach. There. Come back to you. Uh, Beichman. Uh, yes. Brosnahan. No. Kafaro. Yes. Clark. Not entitled. Oh, sorry, you're not entitled. Sorry. Uh, Dale. Yes. Dosen. Yes. Ford. Yes. Brewer. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Goldman. Yes. Goshow. Yes. Uh, Harris. Yes. Hartman. Yes. Hire. Yes. Isaacs. Yes. Uh, Kalafarski. Yes. Kinsella. Yes. Lagosico. Yes. Levy. Yes. Mafia. Yes. McCall. Yes. Meyerson. Yes. Miller. Yes. Hawson. Hawson. Sorry, yes. Uh, Raybar. Yes. Shapiro. Yes. Plutskin, yes. Uh, Smith. Yes. Spandor. Yes. Stern. Yes. Sung. Is she still on? She was leaving early. She might be off. Okay. Webb. Yes. Whalen. Yes. Yang. Yes. Behar. 
He's on the call. I don't know. Okay. Maybe stepped away. Okay. Motion passes. Okay. That moves us on to parks and public spaces. Clayton. Thank you very much. We have one resolution this cycle to have it deemed read. So deemed. And this was the application from Bryant Park Corporation for their programming and special events for spring and summer of this year. This is usually pro forma as the roster tends not to fluctuate much year to year. But of course, after last year, um, everything was, was uh, up in the air. So we were thrilled to actually hear that they have instituted plans for the return of programming effective immediately. A lot of it's already started. And the full list is in the resolution. I won't go through all of it, but it includes your favorites like ping pong and chess and juggling and birding. Uh, the most interesting new development is a partnership with the American Symphony Orchestra, who is performing, who already has been this month um, in the park. And the way that that is carried out by the Bryant Park Corporation is going to affect future plans for the summer for carrying out movie nights and yoga and dancing, which are the particular activities that there was concern about public safety, distancing and et cetera. So, um, so some of those details remain to be seen operationally. And so some of the resolution is vague about that, but other than that, um, the, the, the roster is complete and there is a return of programming at Bryant Park. So this was a unanimous approval, uh, 17000 by the committee. Okay. Does anyone have a conflict with this application? I don't see any. Are there any questions to the resolution? Any comments? Okay, seeing none, we will vote on this resolution. Yang. Yes. Waylon. Yes. Webb. Yes. Uh, Stern. 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 Okay, we'll come back to Noah. Uh, Spandor. Yes. Smith. Yes. Slutskin, yes. Shapiro. Yes. Raybar. Yes. Austin. Janet. Yes. Miller. Yes. Myerson. Yes. McCall. Yes. Mafia. Yes. Levy. Levy. Yes. yes. Sorry, my. Okay. Logasico. Yes. Kinsella. Yes. Kalaparski. Yes. Isaacs. Yes. Hire. Yes. Hartman. Yes. Harris. Yes. Gashow. Yes. Goldman. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Frewer. Yes. Ford. Yes. Dosen. Yes. Dale. Yes. Clark. Yes. Cafaro. Yes. Rosnahan. Yes. Eichmann. Yes. Behar. Athenale. Yes. Michaelis. Yes. Stern. Yes. Okay. Sorry. This is, it's okay. Okay, that resolution passes, which moves us to Landmarks Committee, Layla. All right, good evening, everyone. We had uh, one application this month. Um, this is for a um, certificate of appropriateness for an application <laughs> at One Union Square West. Uh, this is at the corner with 14th Street. Um, this is a, um, an individual landmark. The uh, applicant is proposing to do alterations to the uh, office entrance to the building. Um, actually, before we go, I go into my presentation, I just would like the uh, resolution to be deemed read. So deemed. 
Thank you. Uh, so continuing on, um, on the uh, on page eight of your resolution package, you have a uh, rendering uh, an elevation of uh, the existing condition and the proposed. So basically what the applicant is proposing to do is to uh, bring the uh, current door, which is uh, non-historic and uh, made of uh, aluminum uh, frame um, and uh, of proportions that are not original uh, to basically bring uh, the door uh, back to its original condition, including uh, respecting the proportions. The door itself is going to be much uh, taller. Um, in the process of doing that, the door is going to be positioned a little bit recessed away from uh, the property line, and as a result, is going to expose uh, brick and stonework uh, that has been uh, hidden by the uh, installation of the current door, which was done uh, prior to the building uh, being designated. Um, overall, uh, extremely high quality work. Um, the, uh, the metal used for the door will be bronze, not aluminum made to look like bronze, but real bronze. Um, the, uh, the stonework uh, restoration will be done exquisitely and uh, we were thrilled to learn that the griffins that were originally um, uh, flanking the, uh, the, the door that, were, that are actually sitting uh, up top uh, will be uh, restored. All well, the griffins were not part of this application, but that made us happy to know that this is happening. Overall, the uh, owner of the building has been a, uh, a fantastic uh, steward for this building. They've been doing, uh, you know, restoration and maintenance of the building uh, over the past decade. And uh, the committee uh, was very pleased with uh, the, the proposal and we voted uh, wholeheartedly, uh, unanimously, 12000 to support the application. Okay. Does anyone have a conflict with this resolution? And does anyone have a question? David. Yes, Layla. Uh, at the top of the proposed elevation, there appear to be the silhouettes of two animals. It looks like perhaps they're flying groundhogs or something. <laughs> I was wondering if you could clear up what those two animals at the top of the elevation were. Yeah. So they, they are the griffins. They're, they're described in the uh, designation report as uh, ferocious creatures. Uh, the designation report is, is just, <laughs> it's delightful. So yeah, so the ferocious creatures will be uh, brought back. Um, they were there originally, they've been removed. Uh, we don't really know when, uh, but they're coming back and they will look as ferocious as they did uh, originally. Okay, any other questions? Any comments to the resolution? All right, seeing none, we will vote on this resolution. Kalis. Yes. Athenel. Yes. Behar. Okay. Uh, Beichman. Yes. Rosnahan. Yes. Kafaro. Yes. Clark. Yes. Dale. Yes. Dosen. Yes. Ford. Ford. Yes. Brewer. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Goldman. Yes. Goshow. Yes. Harris. Yes. Hartman. Yes. Hire. Yes. Isaacs. Yes. Kalaparski. Yes. Kinsella. Yes. Logosico. Yes. Levy. Yes. Mafia. Yes. Call. Yes. Myers. Yes. Miller. Yes. Hawson. Awesome. Sorry, it was me. Yes. Okay. Uh, Raybar. Yes. Uh, Shapiro. Yes. Hutskin, yes. Smith. Yes. Spandorf. Yes. Stern. Yes. Sung. Oh, she's gone. Uh, sorry. Webb. Yes. Whalen. Yes. Yang. Yes. Yes. Okay, the resolution passes, which takes us one of the evening, which is land use, housing, and zoning. <clears throat>
Um, okay, so we had uh, one application uh, that produced a resolution this uh, month. This is um, a, a proposal by the Department mm -hmm. of City Planning uh, jointly with MTA um, for a citywide zoning tax amendment for zoning for accessibility, ZFA. Um, the goal of ZFA is to actually increase the accessibility of subway stations throughout the, the entire city. And um, it offers um, basically two things. The first one is an easement program that would basically allow the MTA to um, obtain an easement into an existing building or a proposed uh, new development um, where a uh, subway entrance or subway amenity could be constructed. Um, and uh, overall, we felt that you know this easement program was uh, was sound and and well thought out. Uh, the second part of the zoning tax amendment um, is a bonus FAR. So FAR stands for floor area ratio, and uh, it is the equivalent of density. So it's a density bonus. So um, in essence, basically, the tax says if you are going to be uh, constructing a new building and you elect to build um, a uh, subway elevator or escalator uh, at the subway station near your development site, you can be eligible to receive a bonus that would be up to 20% of uh, the size of your lot. So, um, and that again would be, uh, you know, uh, intent incentivizing developers to basically do construction of necessary upgrades to subway stations to make them uh, more accessible. Um, they, the, the text is, as I said, a citywide uh, zoning tax amendment. It would apply though only in districts that, that, are, uh, that have an R5 designation or more. Um, and um, for, no, I'm sorry, five, five, uh, R5 is for the easement. Um, for the bonus, it applies to our uh, district that are R9 and R10 and equivalent. So in uh, plain English, that means um, areas that have a uh, permitted density of uh, a multiplier by nine. So you take the size of your lot, you multiply it by nine or 10 or more and uh, all the commercial uh, districts. So um, as well as the M16 district, which is the, a manufacturing district. So um, these uh, underlying uh, zoning um, areas basically apply to, I believe, 100% of CB5. Uh, so the, this zoning text uh, would um, impact our district or just very greatly. Um, overall, we support the goal um, of uh, the zoning text, and uh, we believe that you know it, it is sound to actually incentivize uh, um, developers so that they provide a, a public service, uh, especially of such importance as uh, rendering subway stations uh, accessible. Um, we basically had three remarks that ended up being conditions for approval, which is phrased as a denial unless. Um, the three issues that we had was were um, first, we believe that there could be a, um, a combination of incentive and mandate rather than a plain incentive. Uh, so in some instances, um, for example, for very large buildings and very large developments, it could make sense to actually um, ask in the framework of the zoning that uh, a developer uh, participates to uh, transit upgrades. Uh, the, the second point, which was uh, more, more significant, is that we believe that through um, uh, you know, smart and strategic uh, zoning lot mergers, this text could have an overstimulating density effect, which is not the intent of the text. So we believe that there has to be some sort of a cap so that we don't um, uh, over incentivize by uh, you know, developers using lot mergers to create very, very large lots that would uh, then 
have this 20% uh, bonus applied to, but they would mass and they would put all this density only on their development side, which would be much smaller than the entire merged lot. Um, and then finally, the, 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 the most important uh, point that we raised in, in this text is that Currently, um, it reads that if a building is eligible for MIH, which is the affordable housing program that was uh, passed by the uh, current administration, I wanna say five years ago, uh, basically this bonus um, uh, through this uh, um, transit upgrade would not be uh, in commensurate measure uh, affordable. So the, uh, the, this 20% bonus would be entirely market rate, which we found uh, was uh, problematic, uh, was not in the spirit of uh, the uh, affordable housing programs that this, this administration has uh, supported. And so it does not reflect the dire need uh, for affordable housing, especially in our district. As we know, um, although MIH may have been successful elsewhere, um, it has not been successful in CB5, and certainly not despite our advocacy. But you know, unfortunately, um, we have not been able to get to produce affordable housing through uh, special permits in um, our district so far. So for all these reasons uh, that, that I just spelled out, we passed a, uh, a resolution denying the, uh, the um, zoning tax amendment unless uh, those uh, three issues are addressed. We very much look forward to continuing to work with the Department of City Planning and the MTA, um, as well as the borough president and uh, the borough board and our um, other boards, especially in Midtown, because they would be uh, also directly impacted uh, in CB4 and CB6, as well as CB1 and uh, other parts of, uh, of Manhattan um, to, uh, you know, basically uh, make uh, strong recommendations and uh, hopefully shape the, uh, the final outcome of the, uh, the zoning text. And the committee voted in favor. I'm sorry, the vote was uh, unanimous in favor of the resolution 15000. Right, okay. Uh, does anyone have a conflict with this application resolution? Chuck Miller? I do. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, any questions to the resolution? Any comments? Uh, David. Yes, in discussing this resolution and previous applications as well, it just points out how necessary it is that we need to resume or renew our zoning applications that have not been changed since 1961 Hopefully discussion of renewing the zoning laws can be something that we might want to discuss in the upcoming may mayoral resolution. But we've dealt with a lot of these particular problems in land use, and that's just my two cents. Okay, thank you. Clayton? I just wanted to quickly uh, comment that how much I appreciate um, Layla, your work on this, and all my colleagues on the land use committee who did a very careful kind of an astonishingly, I mean, I lose my head sometimes in these meetings, not sometimes, every month. <laughs> and the extremely careful reading of the application and questions to the application and detecting where the holes are in Department of City Planning's responses and then narrowing in on what that means and the impacts of those holes and logic for our district resulted in the language that you're that you all are reading tonight so um yeah so i'm just very proud of the committee and i also wanted to take the opportunity to encourage uh any members of the board who are interested in um in zoning to attend our land use committees to to be privy to these three and a half hour long conversations um so that you can i'm just kidding they're not always that long so that you can um see for yourself and and understand uh what what goes into um formulating these positions thank you Thanks. Well, for, for, full, for full disclosure, guys, you should know that the agenda uh, for the coming month is brutal. 
So uh, members of the committee, we're gonna have a lot of fun. Uh, members of the board, uh, please come by. They will be three hours or maybe four. Uh, bring your pillow, bring a cup of coffee, <laughs> make yourselves comfortable. <laughs> we're gonna have a lot of fun. Uh, ditto everything you said, Clayton. And also I would encourage everyone next month is going to be brutal. Also, I think we've got uh, a lot going on in T&E. If anyone can, uh, if any of you have the, um, can fit it into your schedules to tune in, it's really important. There's an awful lot going on. Lots of things happening. Uh, lots of things that the city is trying to get in before the deadlines. And so we are inundated. And next month is gonna be a doozy. So um, that's my comment. Does anyone have any <laughs> others? Uh, I don't see any. So I think we can take this for uh, to a vote for the last vote of the evening. Craig? Yep. So uh, Yang? Yes. Waylon? Yes. Webb? Webb. Web. Okay. Uh, Stern. Yes. Spandor. Yes. Smith. Yes. Slutsky. Yes. Yeah. Shapiro. Yes. Raybar. Yes. Hawson. Yes. Meyerson. <clears throat> yes. McCall. Yes. Mafia. Yes. Levy. Levy? Yes. Logosico? Yes. Kinsella? Yes. Kalafarski? Yes. Kayback? Yes. Isaacs? Yes. Hire? Yes. Hartman? Yes. Harris? Yes. Goshow? Yes. Goldman? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Frewer? Yes. Ford? Yes. Dothan? Yes. Dale? Yes. Clark. Yes. Faro. Yes. Brosnahan. Yes. Eichmann. Yes. Uh, uh, Athenel. Yes. And Achilles. Yes. And uh, sorry, just one more. Uh, Webb? Pete, are you this Pete? I don't know if Pete left. Looks like he did. Okay. So the motion passes. Okay. The resolution passes, and I. I think I see that Gail, our yes. borough president, is on. Gail, are you there? I am. Thank you very much, Vicki. I could be very quick if you want. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, a couple of things. First of all, I do want to second all of Community Board 5's land use efforts. Obviously, the issue of around yeah. Penn Station, you have been phenomenal. That So far, we've had some meetings. I've done a walking tour with the state, a walking tour with Bernardo, and a lot more to go. So much appreciate. I think they're a little scared of board five and that's good. Good. Um, yes. Yeah. So the second issue, so all, all the work that you've done on the, um, you know, the city planning zoning for accessibility. I think the next hearing is May 20th. That's always challenging because they sure want the individuals who need the elevator to get them, but we don't want the FAR to be too grand. So all of these, everything is challenging. And of course, the work that you're doing on the Broadway redesign, and I'm sure there are, are many others. Uh, just talking about Times Square, um, and um, you know, it's a recent shooting, but it's just a bigger picture. So most recently, I have to say, I met with a terrific, and I can share later on, uh, chief at NYPD. It seems like what's going on um, is that we know that Lorraine Grillo is in charge of um, sort of the recovery, reopening of New York City. As you know, she used to be head of the design and before that, simultaneously, the school construction authority. Chief Monahan is working with her. So that's one place to have some discussion, maybe coming to your um, monthly meetings regarding either safety or regarding reopening or regarding just the, the regular uh, district service cabinet. The second person um, is also working with social workers, police department, and when there is a situation where there are um, individuals who are mentally ill and violent or substance abuse and violent, so there's a whole team looking at that. 
And then of course, there's the individuals you know well who are doing the street outreach. Um, and then of course, there's the usual NYPD at the local precinct level. I think maybe at your borough service, that would be a place to try to have some of these layers uh, talking to each other regarding what's going on in board five. I find everybody's really competent. Everybody's really trying. Um, obviously, also the uh, New York City well, meaning Thrive is also the phone number that's being used. If I see somebody who's acting um, incoherently or in some kind of a, as a citizen, some kind of a violent potential behavior that I figure is happening, I'm supposed to call NYC well, I would normally call 311. So I, I, it's up to you, but I suggested these different layers who I think are coordinating together but I think have not communicated to the community board exactly how they're operating. So something to think about because you understand um, what needs to get done. And I think they could benefit from your input. So I have to say, I've been impressed with the different individuals, but sometimes we're a little bit siloed. Um, in terms of vacant storefronts, we're still waiting for the data from the Department of Finance. Now I'm being told it's October when it would go up on the um, portal, the open data portal, which irritates me because it was supposed to be February, but nothing I can do about it. In the meantime, um, council member Helen Rosenthal and I, um, for the future, just introduced, it hasn't passed yet, but we're calling it the Storefront Bill of Rights without getting into all the details. It's 2299, intro 2299. It's not the same as the bill that's been pending for 40 years. The short version is, it just makes sure that individuals who are renting at the storefront level have at least transparent, boilerplate, some kind of boilerplate um, lease that they understand, because I can tell you many times people sign things they shouldn't, that it's in different languages, that there is at least a year to find a new location. If in fact you can't come to some kind of an arrangement with the owner, it has a whole list of things that the owner has to provide uh, in addition to a lease that you understand. So at least people know what they're signing and what kind of taxes they're gonna have to pay um, if there's no, you have to talk to the owner and the owner could state, I need this for somebody else, in which case you'd have 90 days as opposed to a year. So all laid out, but I think you should look at it and see if you think it makes sense. But I know that recovery comes, vacant stores get filled, and I worry that they could end up not staying very long if we don't have something that's transparent. That's really, it's a transparency bill. Um, we've been pushing for the senior centers to open. I've had at least two press conferences saying to the mayor, and I've talked to him personally and to the health commissioner. I think I've said this to you before, but these seniors are so upset. They see the coffee shops opening, they see the gyms opening, they see the museums opening, and they can't get to their senior center. And not all of them can afford to go to the coffee shop. They want the comedy, they want the bingo, and they want the food and the lovely scratch food that's appropriate culturally and for them. So we're trying. I don't quite understand what the holdup is because most of them are vaccinated. Uh, the senior center directors are the best. They love their seniors. They love the work they do. They care. And they wouldn't let anybody in who hadn't been vaccinated. There's lots of ways you could have, as you do for the gym or for the <laughs> restaurant, certain kind of precautions. So I, I don't know. I'm frustrated by it because they're really upset and, and I don't blame them. Um, I also want to just say that um, we've been having continuing with our Tuesday at three uh, conversations. Um, most recently, we talked about the uh, vaccines. And I think the main issue now is, and I think the mayor and the governor have figured it out, um, what are we going to do about those who uh, really won't get a vaccination? And I think some, we'll see. Does the Metro card for seven days work? Does some kind of ticketing to um, any kind of a sports event work, we'll have to see, but that's where we're at. I've been to every, I think, vaccination site in the borough of Manhattan. And some of them are doing a thousand days. Uh, City College is doing a thousand a day, but the NYCHA was doing 33 a day. So it's a mixed bag. Um, I think that we have to figure out now for those who, for whatever reason, are not interested, but might be, we'll have to see if any of these incentives work. I hope they do. I think it's good that CUNY and SUNY are going to have to get a vaccination before they go back, but I'm sure there'll be some discussion about that. Um, we also have had lots of talking about some of the uh, housing bills that are coming up. And there was a conference today that I was participating in about the hotels. This is always controversial to see if any of them would do 
nonprofit, small hotel, small number. And what I would like is some are homeless and some who are working. So it'd be half and half. I don't know if that's gonna happen. I'm letting you know that's something to discuss. Um, it would be good if we had some site particularly for some of the seniors who are homeless. It is interesting, vaccination sites. There's a lot of temporary work. Guess who's working? People who are homeless. I can't tell you how many times I've been to a vaccination site and some of the people who are signing us in when we go to get the shot, they whisper to me later, can you help me? I'm here, but I'm coming from a shelter. It's happened to me four times now. So it is true, 30% of the homeless are working and we have got to find a place for them to be able to stay. And I'd love them to be in our borough of Manhattan because often they find the jobs here so they don't have to commute two hours. Um, so I'm often focused on that. Um, I know you're waiting on the very little bit slow, I'm not gonna deny it, but we were working almost done with all the community appointments for the community boards and they will be done for the June meeting. Uh, you'll know sooner than that. Thank you very much, Board 5. You're working really hard and I'm deeply appreciative. And as I say to your chair all the time, I have to say a lot of people take your leadership on many of the issues. So you, your work is very important and very serious. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gail. And thanks for coming in tonight. Okay, that concludes our meeting. Um, I will see you on Borough Board, Gail? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay, good night, everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks, Becky. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good, night. good to be with you. Please. Bye. <laughs> okay, bye-bye.